still need a lot of tests to be able to see each other in this study. I'm the So it's like not, not enough to really throw a lot. Okay, we can um, get started. Um, but someone who took this course uh, previously graduate student overheard me and Daniel talking. Daniel asked me again where the .05 came from, and uh, uh, the student, Remy, said uh, it was Fisher who decided that .05 was the, was the uh, correct value. And I think that's correct. That Fisher actually carried out the first statistical test ever uh, in a story that was uh, written about in a book called The Lady Tasting Tea. Does anyone know that story? So there was a woman that uh, he knew who claimed that she could tell when uh, when tea was made whether the whether the hot water whether the tea had been added to the milk or the milk had been added to the tea, and uh, so he carried out a series of trials on this uh, woman, and sure enough, she could tell the difference between <coughs> whether, the, whether the milk had been added to the tea or the other way around, and that was the, that was the first test that I ever. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess he decided then that 0.05 should be the cutoff, and he was fishing, so... Does that mean, like, she got it wrong, like, 5% of the time? So, she got it wrong some fraction of the time, and uh, he carried out a test to show that her uh, results were much better than random. Were, were better, like, ruled out the null hypothesis of, of a coin toss, essentially. It really does make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> As, as in wine, I'm sure, uh, uh, as in tea, there are super tasters and then there's the rest of it. <laughs> 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 
So, um, I'm going to talk about generalized linear models today, and one of the reasons why I start this course with linear models, and then linear mixed models, and then generalized linear models, is they all kind of look the same, and structurally you're doing the same thing more or less every time, because you're trying to fit a model to the data. And one thing I like about R is that the sort of the framework, and the steps that one takes when one fits data that might be normally distributed, or in this case not, is that um, you know, the formulas are more or less the same, and there are some special things we need to learn about, but basically the operation is, is very similar. So the, so the linear models framework is a, is a good one to begin, at least uh, uh, I thought so. So here's what we're going to do um, today. Just to refresh your memory, what is a linear model? A linear model is a, a model where uh, the data y are fitted with a formula that looks like the one there, a series uh, a product between coefficients and a series of x variables where there's a, a plus sign between them. So y is the response variable, x's are the explanatory variables, and uh, the betas are the parameters of the linear equation. Those are the magnitudes that we try to estimate when we fit a model to data. In the linear models framework, we make the assumption that the errors are normally distributed with equal variance. And uh, that's why we do these plots, to see if there's any uh, indication that something has gone wrong and that maybe the variances of the residuals change with the, with the predicted values. And we use least squares, because that works for normally distributed data. And uh, we use the LM command in R to fit those data. And the kinds of linear models that we have uh, fit in the lab and in previous lectures in R it would look something like this. If all we wanted to do was estimate a mean, the mean of all groups or the mean of a single group is that we would just fit a constant. We would fit the data, or we would fit a constant to the data, and, and uh, we can trust that the, the solution, the least squared solution, will give us the sample mean, which it does. And your regression is your sort of uh, archetypal linear model. Y is modeled as a function of just one. Um, X variable in simple linear regression, and early on I showed you that single factor analysis of variance is also a, a, a linear model where we fit uh, a response variable to a, a categorical variable, and I showed you how behind the scenes R uses dummies, dummy X variables to, to fit those categories. So I'm just refreshing your memory here, and uh, this is an example of um, a linear model that we did in the previous lecture where we um, analyze data on the number of Ds the chickadees make for uh, predators having a different um, body mass. And the study that was carried out, uh, you know, actually brought stuffed birds out into nature and recorded the average number of Ds per, per stuffed uh, uh, specimen and found that there was a relationship. There's information in these calls. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to modify this a little bit, and I'm going to replace Y, which is kind of the data, and, and I've written this in shorthand, because really what we mean is that y is beta naught plus beta 1 times x plus an error. And I'm going to eliminate the error term from this equation and just uh, model it using uh, mu as the predicted value for a given x. Okay? And also then to, um, to say that this section of the equation, to the right of the equal, is called the linear predictor. And this is the, the y hats, the predicted y values um, for every x. So I'm going to put it in that form because I want to contrast uh, a linear model with a generalized linear model. And a generalized linear model is structured very similarly to a linear model. And uh, in particular, to the right of the equal sign, it looks the same. We have a linear predictor as before. What's changed is now we're transforming the predicted values using a function here called g. Okay, and this um, g in R and in the literature is uh, often called the link function. And that link function is very depending on the kind of data that we have. And I'll show you the two most common types of data in um, biology in the examples that I'll give. What this formulation allows 
is to fit data that do not have a normal distribution, but have a, a distribution of another kind. And the, the two distributions that are most common in biology are the um, binomial distribution and the Poisson distribution. Binomial distribution for one zero data and the Poisson distribution for data in the form of counts. So generalized, generalized linear models are frequently used in biology to analyze those two kinds of Y variables. And um, it's expected, well, it's known for the binomial distribution and the Poisson distribution that uh, obviously they're not normally distributed, but even more importantly, it's known that the uh, residuals are not expected to have the same variances. And so generalized linear models weights the residuals by the expected variance, and that expected variance is determined by the linear functions. It uses maximum likelihood to estimate parameters, and now you know what that is. And uh, in fact, you could, well, I won't get there, but I showed you, I showed you last time how by brute force you could find maximum likelihood solutions to cases when even when there's two variables and the likelihood formula is fairly complicated. If you ever tried to do that with a simple data set in a generalized linear model, you would get the same answer if you did it properly. And so it uses maximum likelihood to estimate parameters and it uses log likelihood ratio tests to test hypotheses. And now you know what they are. You tried them yourself. And uh, the uh, GLM function in R is how you fit generalize linear models to the data. So um, as I mentioned, the two most common link functions are the two most common kinds of data in, um, in biology where, the, uh, where generalized linear models is used is um, when data come in the form of counts, like uh, the number of mates obtained or the number of eggs laid or something like that. <clears throat> in this case, the uh, link function is the log. So again, we have the linear predictor, and we have the link function for count data uh, um, conforming to the Poisson distribution. We would, we would use uh, log of mu. And the link uh, function, the predicted value on the log scale is, is uh, usually symbolized in the literature by uh, eta. Okay, and then, and then to go from eta to mu and back again, it's just log or the exponential function. And then the other is for um, uh, zero, one data, for binary data. Like whether an individual lived or died, whether an individual obtained a mate or not, or uh, any kind of measurement that's uh, sort of a yes or no, success or failure. And in this case, the link function is the, the logit, or log odds. And so uh, the, the linear predictor is again here, and the function Used that, that, that is used to transform the y hats is uh, log of mu over 1 minus mu. And the inverse function looks like that. So we go back and forth uh, between the, 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 the logit scale and the, um, the original scale. And that's it. That's generalized linear models. And all that remains is to show you how you actually make this uh, work. And um, I'm going to start with an example that uh, we did last week. It is very similar to the one that we did in the lab, where we simply estimate a proportion. All we're going to do is going to take a y variable, which is a series of ones and zeros, and then fit a generalized linear model in order to um, estimate a proportion. So here again is this uh, evil fly, which rides uh, on butterflies and uh, parasitizes her eggs. And, the experiment that uh, I described was one in which the researchers tried to determine whether wasps could actually distinguish between mated and unmated butterflies. And the um, observation that they made in 32 independent tests was that in 23 of 32 cases, uh, the wasp chose the mated female. And, uh, you know, we know how to estimate the proportion of successes or the probabilities of, uh, the, of a correct choice as 23 over 32, but I took you painfully through the brute force method where, where it was not necessary to 
do the complicated fraction, but instead we, we did the, uh, uh, you know, the likelihood function and found where the optimum was, and sure enough, it was a 23 over 32. Now I'm going to show you how a generalized linear model would produce the same result. And this is no coincidence, generalized linear models are a framework for using maximum likelihood to estimate things like proportion. And uh, in this case, the data are binary. So here are the results for the 32 trials. And uh, a data point, uh, a wasp receives a 1 if she uh, correctly chose the mated butterfly and uh, she's assigned a value of 0 if she did not. Okay, so binary data. Success and failure. And so what, um, what we're doing now is we're, uh, here's the linear predictor part, it's just a constant. It's the simplest possible model you could fit. And then here's the link function, which takes the predicted values in and uh, transforms them using the logit. And uh, fitting this um, uh, data with a generalized linear model to estimate the constant will uh, estimate the population proportion. B hat will be the estimate, and we'll be able to go back and forth. We'll be able to get the proportion once we do the back transformation to the original scale the inverse function. Okay, so there's what the, GM, the GLM model would look like. The y variable is called choice here, and all I'm doing is fitting a constant. And now you have some experience with the, um, uh, with the, with the syntax in, in formulas in R. And uh, what's different from a linear model is that now we're specifying uh, the family. And uh, we're saying that... Um, the data are binomially distributed, and we're going to use the logit link function. And here's a plot of the data. So, um, really, this is just a, a, a strip chart for the 1 and 0 uh, observations. And what we're trying to do is to use the machinery of GLM to, to estimate this value here, which is the, um, the proportion. So that's what I did. I fitted this model to the data, and uh, this is what I got. So the estimate of the coefficient <coughs> is uh, 0.9383, and uh, here's its standard error. And um, this is another coefficients table, and uh, like coefficients tables for LM, it will also include, uh, in this case, a z-score and a p-value, which I've crossed out because I have I tried to encourage you right from the start to use the summary command that generates the coefficients table to estimate things, and then to use the ANOVA command to test things. And in this case, it's uh, also important because these, uh, this, the, 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 the WALD method for, um, uh, for testing the null hypothesis that the slope is, or that the proportion is 0.5 is not very accurate. It's not as accurate as the log likelihood ratio test. So in this case, I really do want you to scratch that out. Now uh, you say, well, wait a minute, that's not point, that's not 23 out of 32. Ah, but don't forget, this is all on the logit scale where we estimated this. And so to convert this estimate back to the original scale, we have to apply the inverse transformation of the logit function, and we get 0 0.7, which is exactly what you get when you divide 23 by 32. Okay, does that look familiar? So now we've calculated this in three ways. The 23 divided by 32, we have done it the brute force way, and now we've used generalized linear models to do it. And, and uh, my claim is that the reason we get the same answer is that all of these methods are giving us the maximum likelihood estimate of the proportion. The other... Um, the uh, thing that I'm going to take us through is the log likelihood ratio test then, again using the machinery of GLM. So here again is the output of the summary command. And uh, here we're um, um, reminding you that the, the Z value, the wild statistic, is not as uh, uh, reliable as the log likelihood ratio test. The null hypothesis um, that's being tested here is that this um, that the mean is uh, zero. 
And uh, that's equivalent to testing the null hypothesis that the proportion is 0.5. It's just a coin toss. Because if you take zero and back transform it to the, in, to the, to the ordinary scale, you get 0.5. So 0.5 on the, on the um, ordinary scale, on the one zero scale, is equivalent to zero on the large jet scale. So it took uh, a little bit of getting used to going back and forth between these, these two scales and then learning what is in the actual output that R gives you. Oh yeah, uh, before we get to the log likelihood ratio test, um, I wanted to show you that uh, we can also take this uh, model object, the, the GLIM uh, GLM model object, and um, get a 95% confidence interval for the proportion. And uh, to do that, we use this command in the mass library called content. It knows what to do. It knows that this is a GLM model object, calculates the CI on the transform scale, so we have to do the inverse transformation to get our 95% likelihood-based 95% confidence intervals back on the ordinary scale. And this is exactly what we got when we did it by brute force. Okay, yeah, so uh, as I said, use summary for coefficients, use ANOVA for um, hypothesis testing. And uh, in this case, ANOVA will we'll know that uh, um, we'll be able to uh, handle a GLM model object and uh, carry out a test for us. And uh, what I've done here is I've actually done two things, and I've fitted the model, both the full model and the reduced model for the test of um, the proportion, test of the null hypothesis that the proportion is 0.5. And uh, here's the full model where I fitted a constant. What is the reduced model for the case where the full model is fitting nothing but a constant? And the answer is, uh, uh, this is the reduced model where the, um, the coefficient is assumed to be 0 or 0.5 on the original scale. And so, um, ANOVA can compare two models, <coughs> such as this, and what results when you use ANOVA is you get a table which is kind of analogous to an ANOVA table. It's called an analysis of deviance table, rather than an analysis of variance table. And uh, the deviance that uh, is relevant here is the, essentially the measure of the improvement in fit of the full model relative to the reduced model. And that's the g-statistic that we calculated in the, um, in the lecture uh, last week on the log likelihood ratio test. And that's the p-value that we got. Okay, so this is exactly the g that we calculated when we got the likelihood ratio uh, ourselves last week. So it has an approximately chi-square distribution under the null hypothesis. And so it's compared to the chi-square statistic. Okay, so 6.227. Whoops. Hang on. One of those is a typo, and I'll figure out which one later. Okay, so it's no coincidence we're getting the same result this week as we got last week when we, when we did all the calculations either by brute force or by hand, and that's because we're doing the same thing. That's what GLM is, is actually doing. Okay, so on to a more realistic example, and that is our uh, logistic regression. So logistic regression is like linear regression, but it's on the logit scale. And one of the most common applications for logistic regression is um, toxicology or other um, areas where we want to look at uh, dose and response. So this is a, a dose response experiment that was actually done on monkeys, uh, looking where, where the, the, um, the toxin or the, the dose being manipulated was the concentrations of anthrax bacteria being provided. And then uh, what was recorded was the mortality. So a one means the monkey died. And uh, zero means that the monkey survived. Sorry, I know this is a little bit gruesome, but people actually do this. <clears throat> um, 
And so what we're interested in in studies of this kind, in toxicology studies, is the relationship between dose and the probability of death, or the probability of, you know, it doesn't have to be dead, it could be some other binary metric of success or failure. But in this case, it's uh, dead or alive. And in this case, death is success. So we're modeling the probability of death as a function of dose. So we know that the measurements are either one or zero, and this creates a problem. Linear regression won't fit. And there's a number of reasons for this. One is that uh, for each x, we imagine that there's a, a relationship between mortality and um, anthrax concentration, but the, the residuals are going to be binary. They're not going to be normally distributed. That turns out, although that's a problem, it's not nearly as significant a problem as the second one, and that is that the variances are heterogeneous. If the, if the residuals have a, a binomial distribution for any x, then the variance of the residuals will depend on, him, on what that probability of death actually is. So the variances are heterogeneous, they're known to be heterogeneous, and uh, ordinary linear regression does not deal with that well. Finally, a linear regression you know, will go potentially below zero and above one, which can't really happen when the data are uh, mortality. You're going to have a negative mortality or a mortality rate exceeding one. Okay. And in this case in particular, you can't just transform the ones and the zeros in order to render it linear. Because the transformation, the logic transformation of zero is minus infinity. And the logic transformation of one is plus infinity. And you can, you, you know, you can fiddle with it. Oh, let's just call this point 0.99 and this point 0.01. And that, that's messy. It's not beautiful. You want to look good when you're analyzing your data. And, uh, uh, you know, style is important. But um, the result that you'll get if you sort of directly fit the one zero using GLM is that the results will be intuitive and interpretable in terms of the original variable without having to work on the interpretation of a variable which isn't 0, 1, but 1 to 1.99. Okay, so here's the um, generalized linear model that you would fit. In this case, there's one um, explanatory variable, x. That's the, um, the dose. So it's like a linear regression, except uh, rather than fitting a, a, simple per, um, a, a simple y hat predicted value, we're going to transform the predicted value using the link function. So we're not transforming the explanatory variable, it's the predicted value that we're transforming. And the rest of it is just a linear predictor as before. So mu is going to be the probability of death, and g is going to be the link function that transforms probability of death onto the logit scale. And it's on that logit scale that we'll be fitting the data. And then we'll transform it back, and everything will be intuitive. Okay. The interpretation of the linear predictors is the same, an intercept and a slope. And uh, th this is uh, uh, called also in the literature the uh, logistic regression. Uh, if you've heard logistic regression, it's a generalized linear model where the data are binary. And here's the R syntax for fitting it. The formula should be familiar, it's just like that you would use for, um, for LM, an ordinary linear model. Except now we're using GLM, we're specifying that the data are binary, and uh, that we're using the logit function. So GLM uses maximum likelihood. It finds those values for B0 and B1 for which the data have maximum probability of occurring. And uh, we did this for estimating proportion last week, and also in a more complicated example where we had two things we were trying to estimate, extinction, speciation. No different here. In fact, I have done this, just done a grid search for beta 0 and uh, beta 1, or the best estimates of those, using maximum likelihood, using the brute force method that I described or showed to you last week, and I got exactly the same answer. I did this just to convince myself if I stood up here and said that I got the same answer, I better well have got the same answer. Okay, so know what, how the likelihood method works. Choose the values of the parameters 
that maximize the probability of the data you observe. So unlike linear models, there's no nice equation for the maximum likelihood estimate of the slope and the intercept. Um, GLM has to use an iterative procedure, which is a, a bit more sophisticated than our brute force approach, but nevertheless, is a brute force mechanism. So behind the scenes, R is getting closer and closer and closer to this maximum. And then when it gets close enough, the, it stops and says, here are your maximum likelihood estimates. So this is what I got. <clears throat> so summary, again, use that to estimate coefficients. And uh, these are the uh, intercept and uh, the slope. And these are an intercept and a slope on the, uh, uh, when predicting the transformed um, mortality. So as I said, ignore this and just marvel at the estimates you obtain and what they mean. One thing that you'll see on the output is the number of Fisher scoring iterations. Fisher again. It's hard to escape the guy. So yeah, he came up with the uh, a method for finding the maximum likelihood solution. I told you he invented the likelihood, princi the likelihood principle. He sort of developed that whole method of analyzing data. Anyway, as I told you, it's an iterative procedure going on behind the scenes. And here it's telling you how many iterations it went through before it got to pretty much right on the maximum, and then it stopped. And uh, that's useful because sometimes if this number is really large, you can go, okay, it's having a hard time finding the maximum. And if it's really small, you go, that was easy, good, I can, I can trust the results. So the numbers in red are the estimates of beta naught and beta one. And uh, they are interpretable in the same way, the, uh, the intercept and slope. But they describe uh, the, um, the effects of the explanatory variable on this quantity, not on the probability directly, but on the logic of the probability. And um, if, you, um, if you use Visreg to visualize the fit of the model, uh, it'll look like this. So here is. Um, dose, the anthrax, anthrax concentration. Here is mortality, and this is your maximum likelihood estimate of the relationship between those two variables on the logit scale. And this is your um, standard error or confidence. Uh, I have to remind myself whether that's the uh, uh, confidence interval. I think so. Um, the only thing that's left to explain is, what are these dots? And uh, my answer would be, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> so the way, the way uh, GLM figures out or finds the maximum is that it makes a guess, transforms it back to the original scale, calculates the residuals, transforms the residuals back to the logit scale, adds them to the prediction, and then does another fit. And, uh, that's all you need to know, and, and uh, it calls these, R calls these working values, and they're really just values that are used en route to finding the maximum likelihood solution for the slope and the interest. But they don't really mean anything in particular other than that. And uh, I don't have any more details for you, but I can, I can uh, tell you more if you're interested. Once you have the predicted values, you, got, you have the linear relationship on the logit scale, now all you have to do is convert those back, those predicted values back to the original scale, and you have your um, logistic curve describing your maximum likelihood estimate of the relationship between dose and mortality. And you can transform the, the limits, the, the confidence interval as well. So that's logistic regression. It's just um, an application of maximum likelihood, which I know you feel confident in now that you've done the workshop. You know kind of how it works. The only thing I guess that's really different from ordinary linear regression is that the, um, that the residuals are expected to uh, have different variants. 
And so uh, every time it estimates the linear relationship, it weights the data points according to their expected variance. So it carries out a weighted regression, essentially a weighted least squares regression on the logit scale. So in um, toxicology, what's also used as a, a useful measure is something called the LD50, the lethal dose 50. And uh, it's just the uh, ratio of the intercept and the slope estimated on the logit scale. So the coefficients that you get in the summary, in the, in the uh, table output of the summary command, can be used in a straightforward way just to get the LD50. And they're readily interpretable that way. So the LD50 is the value of the dose corresponding to 50% mortality. And that's estimated here to be um, a dose of about 48. And uh, the math library will allow you to um, calculate uh, a standard error and even a confidence interval for the LD50. Okay, so that's how generalized linear models works. It looks a bit similar to linear models. The linear predictor is the same, but there's a transformation of the predicted y's. And that function is called the link function. It does the transformation. So, this, using generalized linear models has some advantages. It's more flexible than just transforming the variables, although that can still be used as well. And um, it, it, it results in more interpretable output than would be the case, say, if you tried to convert the data using the arcsine square root transformation. It avoids problems associated with transforming zeros and ones. And it's pretty much the familiar analysis framework modified. Um, and I drew this slide up. If you downloaded the slides earlier this morning, this graph wasn't there. I added this late. But I decided I would just put in a um, sort of a visualization of the situation when GLM is appropriate and when it's not. So here's a situation in which we have um, you know, fish tanks in a row, and we've randomly assigned two treatments, A and B, to those fish tanks. And the response that we're scoring is whether the single individual within that tank lives or dies. So that would be similar to the, um, you know, the toxicology experiment we just did, where every individual is independently subjected to a, a particular treatment, and uh, individuals assigned different treatments are interspersed. And so we know from reading the Hurlburt paper earlier on that we're safe uh, from pseudo-replication in this case, because the individuals being interspersed are actually the independent replicates. And so one and zero are the data that we would obtain from carrying out this study. However, often experiments, particularly in fish, are done with more than one fish per tank. And the, the, instead, the fish come in groups, and it's groups of fish that are interspersed and design different treatments. And in this case, each tank gives us four measurements rather than just one. And this represents a situation in which a GLM is not appropriate. And that's because the data aren't zero, one, or at least the data on the independent replicates are not zero, one because the fish are not the independent replicates. The tanks are the units uh, that the treatments have been assigned to, and it's the tanks that are interspersed, not the individuals. And so we know already that, in this case, there's two ways, and if this was a linear model type problem, there would be two ways in which we might consider analyzing these data. And the first is to um, you know, go with Murtaugh on this and, and just use the summary statistic for each tank. So use 1, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0, 0.75, or 0 0.75, 0 0.25. So in other words, just take the measurement of the tank, that's the independent replicate, and just fit a linear model, transform if you have to. Okay. For the bottom example, <clears throat> if you um, take into account the 
differences in tank in the model can you then use? Right. So you've anticipated my okay. second part, which is that another way that we might consider analyzing these data is using a, 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 um, a linear mixed model. And um, in that case, we include tank as a random effect in the, in the formula. So um, you'll remember from the reading last week, Murtaugh has two ways of analyzing the data, and he actually got the same results. One was a summary statistic on each problem, and the other was fitting a, a, a linear mixed model. And the test of treatment effect is the same either way. So it would be um, equivalent, but um, I deliberately chose fish here because the fish are sort of interacting with one another. And if there's a possibility that uh, uh, these fish somehow influence one another, their growth, for example, for example, if they compete for a fixed amount of food given per tank, then even a, um, a mixed model would not be appropriate because in that case the individuals aren't strictly independent. But if these weren't fish, but instead they were, you know, plants potted a meter apart on a plot, then, then in that case, they're, it's easier to argue that the plants are not influencing one another. And then the ones and zeros could be modeled in, the, uh, in, a, in a GLM equivalent of a linear mixed model, a generalized linear mixed model. And uh, they, there's, there's a method in the LME4 package to do that. And if you had a different number of fish in the tank? It would be wrong to do the summary statistic. So, so the answer to that is um, to use the summary statistic is not ideal because because the expected variance will not be the same if the number of individuals. Right. But at the same time, if they influence each other then um, it's not clear what that variance is because they're not independent estimates of the, the mean and the variability of individuals because what this one eats, this one does not and so there's an interaction between them and so in that case, to make the best of a bad lot, just <laughs> take the averages but if you could argue that these really are not influencing one another because they're plants in a group or plants in a, an environment chamber and there is an influence, then you'd be best off using a generalized linear mixed model because it would take the different sample sizes into account. But it's only suitable if the individuals truly are not influencing each other. Does that make sense? So the assumptions of generalized linear models, again, the first one I've just explained. And that is that the data points are statistically independent. Another assumption is that, uh, that you specify the link function correctly. And in doing so, the variances of the residuals that uh, are being modeled correspond to that uh, of the link function you specify. But there is a, a frequent case in, in, it frequently happens in biology that uh, th this is not true. And what I want to do is show you how one can deal with that. So it's one nuance of generalized linear models where the um, variances of the residuals are bigger usually than you would predict based on the link function. And the example that I'm going to use is uh, this one. So these are data from different years on the number of offspring fledged by female song sparrows on Mandardi Island. And it's too bad that Hannah Visti is busy because she would have enjoyed this example. She's a student in class, she's worked on this population. But she's not here? Okay, nobody, nobody got it. Yeah, that's fine, I'll just carry on. <laughs> Uh, so, in this example, the data are not binary, but they're count data. And uh, these data are also suitable for analyzing using um, generalized linear models. <coughs> they're not ideal for linear models. Um, 
in part because they exhibit a tendency which is almost universal for count data, which is that the higher the mean, the higher the variance. So when the counts are low, the variance tends to be low, and when the counts are high, the variance tends to be high. And that violates um, an important assumption of linear models. Also, you know, we can't go below zero for counts if we fit a straightforward linear model, but I guess that wouldn't happen here because we're going to treat these as categories rather than as some sort of continuous variable. But the idea is we want to um, model uh, these data by fitting a constant to each group and somehow deal with the fact that the variance is proportional to the mean. And there are two ways to kind of handle that problem. And one is to transform the data. And the usual transformation of choice is the log transformation. Uh, but because there are zeros, you'd have to do log x plus 1. And, uh, you know, in general, this might be reasonably intuitive, and probably by tomorrow you will have shaken off the allure of generalized linear models and decided that actually, yeah, you're going to do it that way. But um, the other option available to you is to model it using a generalized linear model, just as we did the survival data. Except this time, uh, we're going to use a, a probability distribution that's more suitable for counts, and that's the Poisson distribution. And the Poisson distribution has the property that we frequently see in data, which is that the variance in the mean are proportional. So the higher the mean, the higher the variance. In fact, in the Poisson distribution, <coughs> if we truly fit the Poisson distribution, then the variance and the mean will actually be the same. And the link function for the um, For the generalized linear model for count data is the uh, is the log, the natural log, and you'll see this in the literature sometimes referred to as log linear regression, or even sometimes as Poisson regression. It's just a generalized linear model fitting uh, data that are counts, and in this case we just have to specify that the the, the data will have a, a, a Poisson distribution. Okay, so here's the linear predictor uh, as before. And we've already learned that we can fit uh, categorical data with a, a model of this kind. Behind the scenes, we're fitting dummy variables. We know all about that. Okay, so year is going to be modeled here as a categorical variable. So we're basically just fitting a single factor ANOVA. We're fitting a constant, a separate constant to each of the four groups. And we might want to ask ourselves, you know, are they, is the mean different among those groups? So we fit our GLM and we specify that the link function is going to be uh, Poisson, that the distribution of the data is Poisson, and we're going to use the log link function. And then uh, after having done that, uh, we'll do the summary command, and the, uh, the results are shown here. And the coefficients table looks a lot like the coefficients table that we get when we do uh, when we use LM to, to fit a categorical variable. Single factor ANOVA. And as before, so 1975 is missing. That's the mean, that's the estimate of the mean for the 1975 data. And then 76, this, is, this estimates the difference between 76 and 75. This estimates the difference between 77 and 75. So it's otherwise interpretable as before. So they, this is all on the log scale. So you get the, the coefficients table, it gives you. The summary gives you the coefficients table for fitting the log of the data. So now what I want to do is um, draw your attention to this, and then I will um, tell you what it is. So let me just remind myself that I've set everything of importance here. Numbers and red are parameter estimates. Intercept is the first group. Right. So the other output that you get then when, you, when you use a log link function is this line here, dispersion parameter taken to be 1. What that means is that um, you are assuming, as for the Poisson distribution, that the mean and the variance are always the same. So that is just a feature of the Poisson distribution. And it has only one parameter. 
the mean, and the variance is always the same as the mean. But if there are other things that affect the number of offspring produced by females that is not included in your model, and there's going to be lots of things, variation in territory quality and other variables that might influence the number of offspring produced by a female, then often the variance of the, um, the data will be greater than that described by the Poisson distribution. Um, wait, Israel. So if Israel knows how to deal with uh, uh, GLMs fitted to count data, as shown here. And uh, these are the values on the log scale. That's what I'm, I'm plotting. So these are the working residuals, as before. You can transform everything back to the straight scale by taking uh, using the exponential function. And I did that, and this is what it looks like. These values drawn here are the estimated means on the log scale. Once they're converted back to the ordinary scale, they're no longer the means of these groups. Because they're the means of the log of the data. So technically they're called geometric means. Okay, because it's on the log scale that we're taking the linear predictor. And uh, the analysis of deviance table allows you to test whether there's statistically significant differences between year. So that's ANOVA. The only nuance is that we specify the chi-square test rather than an F test. So then it produces an analysis of deviance table instead of an analysis of variance table. And you, know, you can get your p-value if that's what you want. As with LM, um, GLM fits terms sequentially. Type 1 sums of squares. So that's something I went through in great detail when we did linear model. I'm not going to go through it again now, um, but you can go back to those notes to refresh your memory on what exactly that means. Okay, so uh, assumptions of the GLM fit. The data are independent and so on, but the most important assumption for, um, or an important assumption, for uh, fitting of the log link function and uh, assuming that the residuals have a Poisson distribution is whether the variances of the residuals correspond to that expected from the Poisson distribution. Okay, so the log link function assumes this. And that's stated in the output by the dispersion parameter equally to one. Um, but uh, what often one finds with count data is that the variances are greater than the means. So what I've done here with these two t apply commands is I've calculated the mean number of offspring for each of the years, 75 to 79, and the variance in the number of offspring. So it's that every female has a single number for the number of offspring produced in a year, and the variance is just the variance of those numbers. And as you can see, uh, every time, the variance is actually higher than the mean. Now, a feature of the Poisson distribution is that the variance and the mean are the same, as I've said, and, and yet it's typical that the variance is higher than the mean for real data that are counts, because, um, because there are other things that affect variability among females and the number of offspring they produce that are not incorporated into this model which incorporates only year, such as variation in territory quality, variation among females and their age. All of these things would add variance to the number of offspring produced and produce a pattern in which the variance is actually greater than them. What do we do now? Is a, since like a greater difference between the variance and the mean indicate more other things influencing that? Generally, that's the case, yeah. So, if we calculated the fold difference, I think in this case it turns out to be about 1.3. So in this case it's not actually bad, as bad as we will frequently see in real data. And you're right, the, the, the greater the fold difference, you can probably 
probably implies that there are more other causes not incorporated. When would the variance be alarming? Well, I guess there's no real need to make that decision because there's one other option available to you in GLM, mm -hmm. and that is that there's a method sort of built in for modeling uh, the excessive variance. So, I, I mean, my experience in analyzing data like this is that it's almost always, the variance is almost always greater than the mean. And it almost doesn't matter, of course, the second method should probably be the one that you use. And I think you should use this method anyway just to get an idea of what the fold difference is in the first place so that you can at least report it. So in the workshop, we'll, we'll uh, analyze an example just like that. And so what GLM does is that uh, it sort of carries out a, a, an analysis that models the variance explicitly as um, a product of the mean. And I'm not really going to go into uh, this and exactly how it does this, but it uses a method that's almost like, it's almost maximum likelihood, but not quite. And uh, the jargon in this area is called quasi-likelihood. But it's good enough, uh, and it works. And so what I did is refit these data on the number of offspring produced in each year by some sparrows using the quasi-poisson as the link function instead of uh, Poisson strictly because I'm worried about the, um, the variance being larger than the mean, violating the assumption of the uh, GLM method. And uh, so what we find is that the um, estimates are the same as before, but the standard errors are, wider, are, are larger. And uh, uh, what the the method also provides us, in the end, is a measure, essentially, of the fold difference between the variance and the mean. In this case, it's only 1.23, so it's pretty trivial. Uh, but I did want to point out that the standard errors are larger when you use the quasi-Poisson, and the variances really are larger than the mean, because, well, the variances are larger than the mean, and that extra variance should be incorporated when um, calculating uncertainties of the parameter estimates. And so the quasi-Poisson will do that for you. So that's the, that's the only nuance that log linear regression provides. And now I know you're going to go back to your data, and you're going to, by tomorrow, you will have forgotten this, and you'll just take the log of x plus 1 and analyze it using linear models. But I, I do want you to know that, that, that this option is available to you. And uh, you, can, you can do this whilst never you know, leaving the framework of maximum likelihood, which, as we saw last week, is extremely appealing. Right, yeah, this is just a slide again drawing attention to the um, dispersion parameter. Other uses of generalized linear models, whether there are, there are other error distributions that can also be modeled, not just the binomial and the Poisson, but the gamma and negative binomial and all sorts of other things. So, so it's, it's, it's extremely good at handling data with distributions, known distributions that are different from the uh, uh, normal distribution. Generalized linear models and log linear models in particular are used also to model contingency tables. So um, you can uh, use GLM to fit contingency tables and it allows you to, to test hypotheses and you know, if you have two and three way contingency tables you can look at the pairwise and the three-way interactions separately. It's not just one overall chi-squared test of independence. So it becomes useful um, uh, in that context as well, and I have some examples on the fit model page. Okay, that's my lecture for this week. And um, my last slide is just going to tell you that this is the reading for next week. So uh, it's on uh, online, and I have one presenter already chosen, Fiona is going to do this, um, but I need one more presenter and two moderators. So step forward if you're interested, otherwise our random sampling technique will be used yet again. Thank you everyone.
Did you want to take it?